name is Tom Emmel. I'm director of the McGuire Center of Lepidoptera and Biodiversity at the University of Florida. I first had the opportunity to come here in 1980. Uh, I came down with Lincoln Brower, um, and he uh, and I headed into the mountains of, uh, above Ongongeo to see these monarchs. Well, it's tremendously moving. Uh, we were right in the center of Site Alpha, which was the first site discovered uh, in 1976, and Lincoln began studying it several years later. Uh, so this was about his third trip to see the monarchs and my first. And when we woke up that morning and looked outside of our tent, uh, here were thousands upon thousands of monarchs covering the trees all around us. That first year we had to come in by four-wheel drive vehicle on an old logging road, which was the only access to the area where uh, the site was located for the monarchs. Uh, there were no trails, there were no campgrounds, there were no facilities whatsoever. Uh, we had set up tents under the trees, and during the night it began to snow, and it snowed eight inches. And in the morning when we got up, the tents were bent down. Uh, it was bitterly cold, but we were rapidly warmed by the sight of untold millions of monarchs, actually. It was incredible. And then as the day progressed, the sun came out, Monarchs spread their wings, started to warm up, and it looked like a whole forest of Christmas trees with or bright orange ornaments. Tremendously moving. Must have been beautiful. We were there a week, and, uh, and towards the end of the week, the snow had melted. Uh, we went through the forest looking for the the total size of the colony and how high they were in the trees, tried to figure out ways to estimate their numbers. Um, my background was in population biology, so I was interested in ways to census the population. Lincoln was interested in the phenomena of the migration, how they got there, what they did after they arrived. And this was right at the start of everything. No one had any real idea of what the butterflies were doing, and even a daily cycle of activity or inactivity, as it turned out. How did you go about counting well, the them initially? The early stage was to try something um, that's been used by my research group in Costa Rica, uh, putting a large plastic bag over a branch loaded with the butterflies, the roosting butterflies, and then put a wad of cotton in soaked in chloroform, and that quickly closed the lid or the opening to the bag, and it soon uh, gassed the monarchs so they passed out, and then you put that down on the ground and put the butterflies out on a sheet and rapidly counted them before they all woke up and were ready to take flight again. Oh. <laughs> it was primitive, it's but no one's really found a better way since then, <laughs> and, and you have to do estimates at, at all levels. You, 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 you can get as many as several thousand butterflies in a single bag, you have only two or three minutes to count them while they're gassed and sleeping, and then you have to release them and let them go. And, and then you have to estimate how many of these branches there are on a tree, and how high from ground level to 60 feet up they're occupying. And then you have to figure out how many trees per acre or per hectare, 0.54 acres. and walk the perimeter of the colony. Today we can do that with GPS and get a very accurate circumference. A lot harder before we had that instrumentation in the 1980s uh, to estimate what the circumference of that area is and how best to calculate it via calculus. Uh, today we have everything done by computer and that. Uh, and, but it doesn't necessarily give more accurate counts. We have a problem of what time do you count them. Uh, butterflies normally start arriving around the 1st of November, end of October. Uh, they get on the trees, they start moving up and down the mountain to get to the best temperature range for their winter uh, hibernation, and now all of a sudden uh, more butterflies arrive. And so the Mexican scientists that have been trying to do an estimate every year do it the first week of December. But then they run into a year like this year when no monarchs whatsoever came here for three week, first three weeks of November. And then they came in very slowly. 
So the counts that were made early in December showed there were only half a hectare, six tenths of a hectare, and a total of seven sites. And this, this scared everyone half to death. And World Wildlife Fund released figures at the end of January saying they were only the lowest migration ever. And uh, people were serious afraid this could be the last migration. Um, in our research here this week, we've been able to find out that there are actually four times as many as previously thought at El Rosario and Sierra Chinqua, but still tremendously impacted by something since just last year. Would you talk a little bit about why this habitat is ideally suited for the monarchs? And just by the way, monarchs are flying around behind you there. Good. I'm very happy to hear that. It's warming up as the sun <laughs> hits down on us here. Uh, so the monarchs are spreading their wings and getting warmed up to close to 100 degree body temperature and they're taking off even though it's only about 55 out here. We have uh, a great opportunity here to see why the monarchs have chosen this place. Uh, it's a very narrow altitudinal band from about 10,000 feet elevation to 11,000 feet where the temperatures remain just at about freezing all night, every night of the winter, but warm up during the day to the 50s or 60s. Uh, not warm enough for a lot of activity, but warm enough that they can move to the shady side of the tree or that's part of the forest, because they're seeking cool weather. They do not want to sit out in the sun very long or fly, because that would be burning up stored energy. Here, they're able to uh, sit quietly, um, not move around much, burn up very little of the stored fat, and actually live for four and a half months here on the stored fat that they got during their southward journey. So that's why they choose the mountains. In California and the other western states, they choose the cool canyons and cliffs along the coast, the Pacific Coast Ocean area, and uh, temperatures there in the low 40s or so most of the time. Uh, so that's good for them. But for the, all the ones in the eastern U.S., they have to flee the northern winter. The terrible storms come across places even like Texas and North Florida this year, and that means coming all the way to the tropics, but not in an area that's going to freeze. And a tropical mountain is the perfect place to do this winter hibernation. Can you speak to how long the migration is? And what the, what the condition the butterflies are in when they arrive here and when they depart? Mm -hmm. Well, the migration may be as long as 2,500, 2,600 miles uh, one way for an individual to come from southern Canada or northern U.S. down here to central, south central Mexico. Uh, when they arrive, they're in surprisingly good condition. Uh, the wings are intact. The scales are uh, largely much the same they, as they looked when they left last September to fly down here. And remember, they passed four and a half months here on the site where... They've uh, hibernated and they've been exposed to winds and cold temperatures and banged into branches and so forth. They're a very tough butterfly. This monarch in my hand, I have to realize as a member of that Methuselah generation, it's lived almost nine months now. And now in just a week or two, it's gonna turn around, fly north, a thousand miles at least to Texas. And in this case, this is a male and uh, it will seek a female to mate with here or at uh, um, the uh, first over position area in South Texas, and it'll die at that time. Surely it's worthwhile keeping this species alive, keeping the migration phenomenon in existence. If all it takes is a little alteration of the way we treat the environment, it's well worth that small price to enable this butterfly, which for over a million years, perhaps at least as long as 1.75 million years, has participated in this tremendous migration across three continents on the North American continent. No other example in the world can match it among the insects.
One of the uh, most interesting things about the navigational uh, ability of the Monarch Butterfly is its apparent uh, magnetic detection mechanism. It has uh, particles of magnetite in its wing cells and body cells in the thorax and even some in the head and abdomen. And these little uh, particles act like bar magnets responding to magnetic fields so that when they approach the transvolcanic range, they're approaching an extraordinary magnetic anomaly in the Earth's surface. The recent volcano, volcano uh, activity in this area has brought up uh, large deposits of heavy metals, especially iron ore, molybdenum, etc. And this causes a magnetic disturbance, which apparently the butterflies can detect from some distance off. Because as they reach the southern end of the Mexican desert plateau, uh, they swing west and head unerringly for the transvolcanic range, about 40 miles long, 10, 15 miles wide, uh, where this magnetic, magnetic anomaly occurs. In, in Mexico, for many years, people have been concerned about the amount of logging the amount of firewood gathering and other changes such as by grazing uh, livestock, cattle and horses in the Monarch Reserve. But those factors are largely under control today thanks to the last two presidents in Mexico using the army to uh, enforce anti-logging laws, uh, illegal logging. So while that's been taken care of, the business in the United States has not been taken care of. We have a much worse situation there potentially because the entire Midwest breeding area for the monarch butterfly is rapidly being destroyed. It's being destroyed by two principal reasons. Um, farmers are now able to grow corn or sorghum crops in fields with 100% corn or sorghum plants and no weeds because they have uh, bought seed from the Monsanto Chemical Company that allows um, protection against herbicides as one effect and of a gene, and as the other gene produces, which is derived from bacteria, uh, derives a protein product that's extremely toxic to all Lepidoptera larvae. Their aim was to just target the corn earworm moth in the case of corn, but for some reason um, they developed a product that's so toxic it kills all Lepidoptera larvae. So here we have a corn field that, corn field that year after year has produced hundreds or thousands of milkweed plants in addition to corn, you know, scattered among the corn stalks. It's not harming the corn. It's not doing any injury to the main production of the corn. But these milkweed plants are being killed because midway through the corn season, the farm is sprayed with herbicides, with Roundup in particular, made by Monsanto. And that kills every weed in the field, not just the milkweed plants, but other fruit plants of other butterflies in the Midwest. And this is the largest single breeding ground for the monarch. And in the last two years, it's been wiped out. And we're seeing the consequences of it here in the spring of 2014, with the number of butterflies cut to one-fourth of what they were last year, or less. Perhaps as little as 20% of those that migrated a year ago have now uh, been replaced by their uh, great-grandchildren coming back to Mexico. And this is, is uh, putting us into a spiral. It's going to result in the decimation of the monarch migration phenomenon within two or three years. I'm very afraid that this is near the end unless we do something about this danger. Okay, Tom. Well, thank you very much. That was terrific. That was wonderfully informative. Thank you. Perfect. You're welcome. <laughs> Should we put it over there?